I just wanted to say hi to Peter and is it Druva? I can't hear you, Druva. Yes. You can hear me. Uh, hello, Jack. Hello, Peter. Hello, Tisha. Hello, Tisha. One of my friends yes, oh. yesterday said, uh, uh, her name is Avantika Bawa, uh, uh, an American Indian artist who said, that's my dean. <laughs> that's my former dean. <laughs> And I'm assuming that's Druva, but it could be Peter too. I don't know. Okay, uh, so we are live now. Good evening, everyone. I am Tisha Majumdar, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology curated under TeamWise Review in association with Oxford University Press. Under this theme, TeamWise Review, December 2022, will explore the role of artistic endeavors of society in shaping cultural identity and ideology. I would also like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, poems, and essays. And for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellingyourstory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is JP craftsmanship through sculptures and handicrafts. We are honored to have with us Professor Peter Stewart, Professor Jack Tuttle Snail Ryan and Professor Dhruva Mistry as our esteemed speakers for the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Professor Dhruva Mistry was born in 1957, Kanjari, Gujarat. He studied sculpture at the Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda from 1974 to 1981 and Royal College of Art London from 1981 to 1983. He was elected a Royal Academician in 1991. He was awarded honorary CBE in 2001 and an honorary doctorate from Central University, University of Central England in 2007. In 2020, he won the Kailash Lalit Kala Award of Chitra Kudham and Kalidas Samman of Bharat Bhavan, Bhopal. Next, we have Professor Peter Stewart. Professor Peter Stewart is Professor of Ancient Art and Director of the Classical Art Research Center at the University of Oxford. He has taught and published on many aspects of ancient art, particularly Roman sculpture. His current research deals mainly with art on the edges of the Roman Empire and in other parts of the ancient world, including the Buddhist art of Gandhara. And lastly, we have Professor Jack Tuttle Snell Ryan. Professor Jack Tuttle Snell Ryan is an interdisciplinary artist and curator. His practice explores trans and contemporary culture through the conduits of sonic theory and sculpture. Currently, a professor of art and director of graduate studies at the University of Oregon, he has held positions at several universities, including the School of Visual Arts in New York, Bowling Green State University, and Watkins College. His, this next summer, he will be uh, he will take a position as visiting professor at UGA International Center in, in Cortona, Italy. He studied at Hunter College NY and received his MFA from the University of Georgia, Athens. So now, without further delay, we will start with today's session. I request Professor Peter Stewart to please present your views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you from Oxford uh, to join you and my colleagues here. Uh, I'm rather unlike uh, my colleagues because I'm not a practitioner. Uh, I'm uh, not creatively very talented. I study art made by other people. Uh, and in particular, I study art that was made by people 1500 years ago or 2000 years ago or even longer. As you described, I'm a specialist in the art of ancient Greece and Rome. And in recent years, I've done a lot of research also on relationships between different artistic traditions, including the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Buddhist art of Gandhara. Now, when people are talking about the ancient world, they often say, they often say that antiquity was very visual, you know, in a world when very few people were literate, images were very important. And I'm never exactly sure about that because 
obviously images are very important in our world as well. This is a very visual world. But I think what is true is that in antiquity, uh, a lot of people invested a great deal of, of effort and money and care and creativity in producing sculptures and other kinds of images, handmade images, uh, which were really important in society, really important in their everyday lives. And unsurprisingly, one of the key functions uh, for the creation of works of art in Greece and Rome and in ancient Asia was, was religion. Um, uh, in the Greco-Roman world, uh, it was a polytheistic society. There were many gods overseeing different aspects of life. And people's encounter with those gods on the day-to-day -day basis was mediated by works of art of various kinds. And I suppose, you know, if I could summarize crudely, that they fall into three categories. First of all, there were uh, the statues of the gods on different scales and the different materials, uh, representing the gods in human form, uh, often in a very realistic way. And these statues stood in temples or in shrines or even in people's own homes. Uh, and they served as a sort of a proxy for the gods who were invisible. They served as stand-ins for the absent gods. And consequently, when people encountered the gods in their daily lives, they encountered them in the form of these sorts of sculptures. Now, if you'd asked, uh, say, the average Roman, you know, is this statue actually the god? They would probably have said, well, no, it's not really the god. It's, it's a symbol. It's, it's a representation. It's a depiction. But the psychology of these images is such that, you know, when you, when you encounter lifelike images in human form, you feel like you are, in fact, having an encounter with the divine. And so these images were treated as if they were the gods. Um, and this is something we're familiar with in, fr from different religious traditions in the modern world as well, whether it's uh, uh, certain strands of Catholicism in, in Europe and the Mediterranean or in uh, uh, Hindu uh, practice. Um, the images are really fundamental for that communication. Um, in addition to that, people made images as gifts for the gods, not necessarily to be venerated themselves, but to show respect to the gods, to, to thank them for what they had done, and also to ensure their favour in the future. So one might dedicate a statue of the god or uh, a relief sculpture uh, representing the gods or their stories uh, as, as what we call a votive image. And then in addition to these categories, we have all kinds of sculptures, particularly relief sculptures, which represented stories of the gods, the Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, and they were used for temples and for shrines, but many other kinds of contexts as well, including everyday objects that people carried around with them. So all of this is to say that the ancient world, the ancient classical world of Greece and Rome was filled with these images of the gods and they were absolutely pivotal for human and divine relationships. Now, what's interesting is in, in the Greco-Roman world, religion is very flexible and inclusive and expansive. There's no single doctrine about uh, about about divinity, uh, about the nature of the gods and how their power worked and where they lived. That was something that was up for negotiation and uh, artistic images play a role in that. Um, but uh, more coherent images of the divine start to become more popular as, as certain new religions become start to flourish in the Roman Empire. Mithraism, for example. And, of course, Christianity, which eventually became very well established in the Roman Empire. And then we start to have a whole body of images that represent stories of the gods in a really consistent and repetitive way. When it comes to the other area of my interest in Gandhara, we're dealing with a slightly different phenomenon. There we, we are from the start, from maybe the first century AD, when, when images start routinely to be used uh, in uh, Buddhist uh, veneration. These images are made to convey uh, coherent messages, more or less, and, and consistent stories, 
consistent narratives about the historical Buddha uh, and the past lives of the Buddha and other sacred figures in the Buddhist uh, pantheon. Uh, these images in sculpture at any rate were made especially to adorn the outsides of the, the stupas, which were reliquary shrines made to uh, uh, partly to remember the Buddha, to remember the, the Buddhist past, but also as a focus for veneration uh, for contemporary worshippers. In some ways, however, you know, amidst all of these stories of the life of the Buddha and other Buddhist figures, we have individual images of the Buddha, bodhisattvas, the sacred figures in Buddhism, uh, which are rather like the Greek and Roman cult images, in fact. We have very large scale sculptures which did receive veneration. And in some ways, they're not, they're not so different from what we encounter in the Greco-Roman world. And indeed, the artists of Gandhara, the Buddhist artists of Gandhara, borrow in all kinds of ways from the artistic traditions of Greece and Rome. But that's a different subject, which we can maybe talk about later on. We'll not get into that for now. But I hope I've given you um, some impression of the role of religion in my approach to images in the ancient world. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very enlightening discussion. I now request Professor Jack Snell Ryan to present his views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, this prompt has been, I have some images to share in just a second here, but this prompt has really forced me to think about my work in a way that I don't always specifically hone in on it as. Uh, being related to kind of deific craftsmanship. Uh, you know, I think one condition of contemporary art is that it is many things uh, and not just a single thing. So, uh, but I do want to um, uh, touch on the topic um, and position it according to this prompt. I think one sort of function of art production, uh, in addition to its cultural value, is that it points to social constructs, and uh, that it uh, that it that, that it elevates, that it sort of desires to elevate a viewer. I go to museums to um, look at art as a kind of uh, critic, but also I go as a lover to not only evaluate work, but because it elevates me. And I think a lot of us go to museums and contemporary art sites to sort of be sensitized to human conditions and to elevate us through forms of exchange and empathy. Uh, I think I can, can we, can we share uh, my first slide perhaps? That looks like it's happening. Um, I think artists, you know, have been, have been doing this for some time. Um, so, you know, contemporary art does reach towards the aspirational and, um, uh, I've picked, picked a few words, to sh a few pieces to share uh, that touch and approach uh, and overlap this sort of, sort of prompt in, in ways I think is interesting to consider. Certainly, uh, to some degree, in ways that I've considered maybe for the first time. So can we see my second image now? Only yes, love so. is on the moon? Great. So it's working. Uh, this is just a piece that you know i wanted to talk about sort of the celestial for just a minute uh, how my work alludes to that in some cases um i, I don't think of it quite as, as as much as being a sort of divine uh, reaching towards the divine but for us with this prompt i think maybe it's it's reasonable to see that embedded in 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 in, in this approach, uh, only love is on the moon. I, I think there's qualities here also that I see that overlap. Of course, it's not as uh, Dr. Stewart was saying, representational um, of, uh, of human figures, um, of uh, um, representations of, of figures, but I think it does share, for instance, this one, uh, some Baroque sensibilities. Um, that activate a kind of um, maybe a spiritual space. This is another work called Moon Glow. 
And so, you know, I, I'm interested in this piece too. It sort of alludes to, again, a celestial space, perhaps the divine, godlike qualities, you know. Um, there's also a little bit of cynicism in this piece. Uh, the plug there, you know, that plug that it's plugged into the wall, I think is, is, is to me both comical, but perhaps a little cynical to see how easy it is to control this sort of representation of this thing we look at in the sky all the time. This is just sort of another uh, image uh, for an exhibition of that same piece. Um, looking back at, at, for a second at some of them at an earlier piece, this is called uh, Scriabin's Mustache. And um, here you have a staff with the kind of light at the top, uh, a portrait of this Russian composer, Scriabin, and then this sort of sound piece. And I'm going to get a little bit into sound here in just a moment. The sound piece, um, it broadcasts a sound piece, which is uh, the cries of a young person, of a young woman, uh, um, the sound of a, this sort of comet moving through what I imagine is to be the atmosphere. It's actually winds um, collected from uh, a, a pine tree uh, in Iceland. And these sort of sounds are overlapped to create this experience uh, that's not only visual, but um, is, you know, is, is a sound work. And um, one thing, I, one reason why I was interested in Scriabin is that Scriabin's uh, music was uh, explored atonality uh, at this sort of break in modernism. And um, he was a cynicist, uh, uh, he was a mystic, and he believed his work at this great time of modernism where he was a kind of leading practitioner of uh, a tonality during uh, this uh, switch in, uh, in modernism in Russia. Uh, but his, his goal was to create this sort of spiritual revolution, a dawning of a new era. So there's some conflict in his work that I was really interested in. And I wanted to explore that in this piece, Scriabin's Mustache. Another image of that comet um, and another kind of view of the piece. Uh, my, I'm going to talk about sound in just a minute here and how I think about um, trance and sound as being a kind of divine um, activity. But I also wanted to, uh, just for a moment, uh, focus off of myself and just to think, uh, this is something I'm interested in, in this sort of contemporary artist's uh, other contemporary artists' interest in things like uh, art uh, and, and light. Um, here's a Caravaggio piece, and we see here that this light creates its own sort of subject matter. It creates a focal point off the painting where, where we're drawn to, but it, it, it also activates lines of composition on the figure itself and, and illuminates these objects. I'm interested in, in light and the way it works uh, in the arts for a number of reasons. Um, here's a JMW Turner piece, and we see that this light, uh, there's a kind of, um, uh, a it's a tumultuous space and it's filled with light, but it's violent. And we can see that there's this image here, which is dematerializing and uh, J.M.W. Turner really explored that in his paintings, but at some point this um, light activates new possibilities for abstraction. That is getting away from the figure or getting away from, um, I guess, uh, representational images and looking and thinking more about it as being presentational, as Dr. Stewart talked about. These encounters with the divine move from being representations of things we might know or understand to things that we don't know or don't understand. So I'm, you know, very interested in uh, the art of James Turrell. Um, 
really uses light to activate another thing or illuminate another thing. And we sometimes see that uh, light also is used to uh, um, not only activate something, but just to activate ideas within itself. Here we see a Dan Flavin piece. And here in the States, you know, we see uh, really a number of artists, Drake uh, in particular, here's a picture of him kind of ripping off or taking from James Terrell's work and using it in their own work um, because they see this very kind of spiritual, elevated quality uh, that they want to bring into their own work. So it supports abstraction. It supports sort of spirituality. We have a very strong relationship to light. We literally drink it through our skin. And uh, there's an emotional quality to light and color that I think that a number of contemporary artists are truly interested in. Uh, Olafur Eliasson's another, and my last example of, of uh, other contemporary artists who explore spirituality and, and, and deification uh, in, in other ways. So my interest in sound and trance as a conduit into heightened experiences and landscapes of engagement ideologically drives my identity as a sculptor who explores culture and theory through sound and optics. And I'm just gonna finish up by sharing a couple of works that I've done uh, more recently to get back to these ideas, this idea of drone and trance. This piece is called An Rand Lamp. I have a video here. I don't know if this is going to broadcast. Are you seeing this image move? Yes, sir. Great, fantastic. So the speakers, um, here that uh, broadcast Rand's uh, speech is being transferred into these lights. And these lights bounce back and forth and activate a kind of bilateral stimulation. That is, they are stimulating left and right brain hemispheres in the viewer's brain and a kind of activating and connecting the hemispheres that connect logic and memory. So as you can see, Anne Rand's eyes are going back and forth. This also controls the light bulbs in this sort of custom software. And as her eyes dart back and forth and her voice shares these complex ideas she's working on, the lights bounce left and right, also connecting in the viewer, much like Anne Rand herself, are connecting these complex ideas in memory and logic and left and right brain hemispheres. Let's move on to a couple more pieces here. I have uh, this piece called The New Listeners. And uh, here we have two uh, conks you see next to each other. You'll see this piece in just a second. Um, these two conks are sort of speaking to each other. This piece I think of almost as being figurative. And we talk about, um, as Dr. Stewart was kind of, of a representational figurative work, I think of this piece as being almost really figurative, like a, a body, uh, a head up here, these light bulbs, one light bulb is on, one is off, they're illuminating each other. So it, to me, it sort of like uh, reaches out towards left and right brain hemispheres, the head really uh, alludes to the head as a figurative element. And we see that in uh, this animation that I've done, and we see this in drawings that I like to build. Uh, and we see that in this speaker array down here, this allusion to left and right brain. This particular sound piece, out of the left speaker is one tone, out of the right speaker is a different frequency tone. And together, when the human head hears this, it illuminates a kind of third tone, uh, a um, autoacoustic tone created in the head, a melding of the tree. So it really creates a kind of fictional tone or another entity. 
Um, and I find that um, this kind of approach to sound uh, is aspirational and does reach for sort of the divine or the deific. We can see this uh, conch piece as well. Again, a better shot of it here too. They seem to be sort of listening to each other. Uh, I've also created drone pieces. For instance, uh, right here, this is a drone that is coming through a 30,000 year old woolly mammoth tooth. We see this uh, speaker array in a different format and the two conks listening to each other sort of paired together in a diptych and uh, in a way both in their own way are kind of alluding to this third entity. The Schumann Residence Conduction Unit broadcasts a frequency that is a, uh, the Schumann Residence is a resonant tone of the earth uh, that is um, uh, uh, the kind of resonant tone that the earth as, as this uh, entity uh, broadcasts. And it's, it exists outside of the typical uh, sound frequencies that the human ear can pick up, although some people are very, very sensitized to it. And finally, I think I'll just end with this uh, wind chime that I've built. It's this mystic tone sequence wind chime. Uh, the piece is called uh, the Lost Chord or the Mystic Tone Sequence Wind Chime. And it's an eight foot tall wind chime tuned to this mystic tone sequence, which was the um, uh, a tonal sequence that uh, Scriabin was interested in. I think I'll just end there. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for this very insightful presentation. I now request Professor Juva Mistri to present his views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Uh, I have uh, scribbled down some points because I am not in the habit of uh, lecturing for the last 20 years. So I will try to get my uh, hand and mind to understand things that I like which is art and craft of making art. So while talking about basic uh, craftsmanship through sculpture and handicraft, I am aware of the fact that my mother tongue is Gujarati and the national language is Hindi. As a visual artist, art is my third language. My primary and secondary education was done in vernacular Gujarati media schools, where English was an optional subject. Despite its international appeal, and as well as national awareness, it is a challenging medium of communication. At the Faculty of Fine Arts, when I began studying the art, I learned that I had to work hard to understand and learn English uh, for my studies and perhaps uh, to, to be able to communicate my ideas with the wider world. You know? So that is where uh, I. Uh, Stop. When I went to London, I learned things from uh, my friends, and I asked them to correct me whenever I was wrong or not correct in a certain way. And um, the idea of the godlike thing, um, in a work of art, is very engaging. I think it's artistic skill in any occupation and trade attracts artists as well as designers. Uh, they are the main things that other people that what is special in it, what is immortal, what is eternal, and what is beautiful. Uh, to be Michelangelo or a master craftsman in India making the image of the divine beings or gods, have a set free the spirit of the figure. Uh, be it an angel or the devil. Concept of prana, the light giving force, you know, unites the spirit of classical Indian figuration. And as an artist maker, my understanding of visual images enhances my ability, skill, 
and patients to realize the required qualities of the form. Reliability, uh, reliability of materials, means, and process of the work challenge intentional forms of expression. It's where all present explorations of the collective beliefs, values, and principles, and how they influence practice in the given time, space, and variety of locations. Ideas of modernity and liberty have freed artists to pursue the personal through artistic creations beyond the conventional and popular. Modern and contemporary explorations with digital media reveal the boundary between painting and sculpture being continually dis uh, displaced. Sculpture as an art of making two or three dimensional representation studying images, whether they are abstract or figurative, made of carved stone, glue, or cast metal, or in plaster. And hence the known uh, uh, among uh, the various of sculpture. One of the key aspects of making sculpture is how the artist uses and controls space and its forms by presenting the suitable height, depth, volume, and shape in its work. I want to understand the nature of creating this thing, nurtured by my family, immediate surroundings, and environment, apart from reason and visual discipline. Good writing and writers can't be imagined without them being competent persons by understanding available materials, means, and skills, sharing ideas of interest. Artistic activity excavates nondescript forms of beauty, personal spirituality, and other factors. I want to find the forms of self-expression, which is much more enriching than pursuing ideas of convulsing perfection. This causes cause dismay and discontent. Although art is an artifice, the popularity of regional visual images representing sociocultural and religious beliefs has not discouraged storytelling in the world. We have art, so we won't buy our truth, say public Nietzsche. The art networks, ideas, art articulates subjectivities and curates and creates communities, while sculpture reveals its own space. A lifelong interest in the arts of Egyptian, Greek, and Mesopotamian, as well as Chinese, Indian, Mexican, and other cultures has contributed to my uh, eclectic interests of understanding and using forms. In the Indian subcontinent, sculpture has been the most developed medium of artistic expression. Sculpture and reliefs remain to be an inseparable part of art and architecture of India. The sculpted images with almost invariably accepted human forms have instructed uh, and inspired people of Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, and other sites in India. Unlike contemporary art, traditional Indian sculpture presents a lack of individual style and variety of forms. Artists of classical images conceive them as shapes, and they remain to be more competent and finer than things that one can find in the shortening visual appearance of the human models. In the image of men, the multiple eyes, hands, and arms of sculptured divinities display the manifold attributes of God's, of God's power. Conventional sculptures express a variety of ideas, convey religious beliefs, and tell the story of significant figures in history, including mythological adventures. Three thousand years old, small character figures of Indian sculptures are found from the Indus Valley and other city, other sites. The outline categories made of circular stone pillars of the Mauryan period present the mature beauty of Indian figurative sculpture, the kind of infusion of the light breath in Hindu and Buddhist themes make many images immortal. Over the last 3,000 years, a wide range of styles and traditions have subsequently flourished in different parts of India. From 9th and 10th centuries onwards, Indian sculpture has reached a kind of abstraction where the figure of form 
Bilal Azakhan, who can name the Rabbinda, who has learned like a body, sets straight at stand on the palm and the last chair with the little change up to the present day. Indian sculpture is distinguished by the linear character more than the more and more than its sense of plastic volume and freeness. Outline of the figure with graceful, slender, and subtle limbs, present widely excitement of being alive and active. Unlike the deadly stillness of the Egyptian and death-ridden anger of Mexican and Latin American art, clearly of Indian life forms is used in architectural decoration, unlike Christian sexuality and tomb like monuments. Even in the digital age, figures are bearing scale and qualities are being produced by craftsmen, presenting abstracted human forms using technology to match the timeless essence of the bygone by era. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we shall now begin with our question answer session. So my first question is to Professor Peter Stewart. Gandhara sculptures are influenced by traditions from both the East and the West. Could you shed some light on this with reference to your publication, Roman Sacrophagy and Gandharan Sculpture? Yeah, absolutely. Gandharan art, ancient Gandharan art is has become a very popular subject today. And one of the things that people find interesting about it is that, that the Gandharan sculptors were influenced by other art traditions in different parts of the ancient world, in, in other parts of the Indian subcontinent, in, in the uh, lands, uh, the Persian traditions of what is now Iran. Uh, but above all, the Greco-Roman art, uh, several thousand miles to the west. And the very first people to, as it were, rediscover Gandharan art and to study it in the 19th century were largely colonial officials and soldiers, uh, many of them you know, trained in uh, Greek and Roman history and literature. And they were astonished to find sculptor, sculptures which which were so reminiscent of the Western tradition uh, that had originated in Greece and Rome. And it, since then, it's remained a puzzle, really, why, why the artists there were so interested in borrowing uh, from these foreign traditions. And they borrowed in terms of the styles used, the clothing of the figures, gestures, uh, some of the specific uh, compositions of stories. And uh, most famously, the image of the Buddha himself in human form, the, the, it, it almost certainly is imitating aspects of idealized Greek and Roman images uh, that were used for representing gods like Apollo. So it's an extraordinary example of cross-cultural uh, connections in ancient art. Um, from the very beginning, from, uh, since people started to discuss this subject in the 19th century, it seemed like the obvious explanation for this must be that this area in Central Asia and South Asia, as far as the River Indus and a little bit beyond, had actually been conquered by the Macedonian Greek king, Alexander the Great, and it had been ruled over by his uh, successors, by kings who regarded themselves as being Greek, right down into the say the beginning of the first century BC. So surely people said this is a kind of hangover from the Greek occupation of these regions. And that remains a, a very compelling suggestion. But at a very early stage, there were researchers who, who questioned that. And they, they suggested that actually a more rational starting point for explaining this phenomenon was the, 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 the contemporary Roman Empire which was flourishing as a center of sculptural production at exactly the time that the Buddhist artists and Gandhara started to produce these extraordinary works for stupas in the first, second century AD, third century AD. And uh, I suppose I belong in that tradition. It's become more and more uh, widespread now among scholars working in this area. And um, 
it seems to me that uh, some of the uh, most obvious connections are not with some kind of Greek past, but with the contemporary art of the Roman Empire. The reason why this is very hard to prove is that Roman art itself was really thoroughly influenced by earlier Greek traditions. So it's hard to find anything Roman in art that, that isn't precedented in, in, the, in earlier Greek periods. Um, so uh, the, the article you refer to is a chapter in a book that I co-edited as part of a project we have here in Oxford called Gandhara Connections. Uh, my, uh, my paper dealt specifically with the relationship between Gandharan sculptures and Roman sarcophagi, Roman stone coffins, which were often elaborately decorated with scenes from mythology. And there's some extraordinary parallels between the compositions on the Roman sarcophagi and the scenes that we see in the Buddhist stupas of Gandhara. And it strongly suggests that at least part of the explanation for Gandharan art's appearance was that there may have been artists from the Roman Empire brought into Gandhara uh, sharing their expertise and their ideas, and that some of this became embedded in the repertoire of the artists in that region. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there was a lot of Roman influence in Gandhara sculptures. I would argue so. Yes, there, there are. I mean, there's a tremendous, in the past, there's been a tremendous fascination with the authority of ancient Greece. And, uh, you know, an idea that Greece is a kind of cultural origin. Well, so it is in many respects. But, uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to think about Gandharan artists in relation to what's going on at exactly the same time in the Roman Empire. What happened was that, you know, in maybe the second half of the first century AD, the uh, affluent Buddhist population of Gandhara wanted to convert their worldly wealth into monuments for the Buddha, which would accrue merit for them. Uh, and there's an explosion of interest in doing this, a real boom in Buddhist monuments and the demand for sculptures to adorn them, which was unparalleled in, in the, the other great artistic centers of India at this, at this stage. And one could well imagine that faced by this demand, the, the people of Gandhara turned to the place that at that moment in history was literally the biggest center of sculptural production on the whole planet, and that was the city of Rome. And in some ways, the ancient world was very, very connected. It, was, it wouldn't be the only time in antiquity that we know that you know, artists were brought from one place over a huge distance to contribute their skills and expertise to, to projects in another region. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful answer. Uh, my second question is to Professor Jack. Uh, in your solo exhibition, The Last Court, you mentioned the quotation by Walter Pater, that is, all art constantly aspires towards the condition of music. What is your take on this in terms of the aspiration of classical sculptures? Sir, you're, you're muted. So you're still on mute. So you're still on mute. You have to unmute yourself. You came off mute for about one second and then <laughs> it became yeah. mute. There we go. How's that? Yes. yes, sir. We can hear you. I guess I was controlling my own mute. I didn't realize that. Uh, thank you. You know, uh, this is a great question. This seems like a trick question. <laughs> it's a really good one, though, right? So the thing about art um, aspiring towards uh, what Pater calls the condition of music, I think what you know, Pater means is that music is really present presentational and not representational. And so it elicits a different experience. I mean, of course, I think that, for instance, like Dr. Stewart would say, you know, that 
uh, these gestures, these representational gestures of classical sculpture are their intention is to elicit uh, a sort of divine, uh, um, uh, um, to allude to something div to divine or to reach for perfection. Um, but of course, classical sculpture is largely rooted in representation. Music is just presentational. It presents experiences much like sound, much like color that are, e that are more broadly capable for uh, uh, listeners, um, viewers to enter into but really to, to draw out, to tease out uh, their own experiences. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're reaching, I think what they share is uh, that they're both reaching for perfection. They desire uh, to be aspirational. They desire to be idealizations of something divine through perfection. Even though the strategies are very different. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my third question is to Professor Dhruva Mistry. In a description on you by Saffron Art, it is said that you combine religious art of ancient civilizations along with the popular art of the bazaar. Could you elaborate on this with examples from your own sculptures? Um, in fact, I have never made uh, images of gods, never for worship or anything. I only see uh, images in terms of them being uh, human or being figurative. And uh, I haven't uh, 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 really, uh, say, taken things uh, uh, from any religious or other point of view. Uh, so my, uh, the idea is, uh, uh, which interests me whether it be a sculpture representative of you being a, a human, a human uh, as a human form, or even uh, non-figurative forms. For instance, Dankus's works will aspire uh, 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 or indicate a kind of immortality of uh, an idea, where the form itself actually points towards elements of eternity. Uh, in the same way, uh, for me, uh, whether it be a piece of sculpture from Greece, Mesopotamia, Gandhara art, uh, Mauryan art, Mathura art, uh, or uh, Sanchi, uh, or uh, even Dilagand Riyakshi from uh, Patna, they are all extraordinary images where things are made in order to oh, oh, make an idea absolutely uh, eternal uh, by all the sensual means within the given materials uh, and its scale. And um, it's quite extraordinary that a stone can, in fact, transform your ideas about stone and reshape uh, 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 and, and let you think that a uh, stone is not a dead thing, but it is something alive. Uh, and um, um, I can show something about uh, the uh, ideas of bazaar art and all. Uh, thing is, uh, no idea actually is, is, it is an illusion to think that uh, uh, we have ideas which are original. Because if that is the case, we would never make aliens look like humans. You know? uh, and, and aliens actually do look like humans purely because we, we need aliens and we are aliens. So maybe uh, from that point of view, uh, if we see <laughs> that uh, uh, the how humans and element, uh, animals are pretty close, uh, and uh, uh, I have tried to explore that since my student days, because if you see an image of Hanuman, uh, it will remind you of a person. But if you see, a, uh, see an image of a monkey, it will also remind you of a person. You know? Uh, so, uh, we, we got to see that gods are actually in the image of man, and uh, it, is, it is there that uh, much of the magic uh, lies, you know, whether we, uh, uh, we actually imagine a matchstick to be a person, or we truly make an image of a person which would 
that which would literally say uh, uh, have the attributes of a god, a god-like being, you know. So, so we can, uh, can show you quickly some of the things from uh, my slides. Uh, if you uh, um, uh, uh, let them, I don't know how this Yes, sir. How this you can share the screen and we'll put it up. Huh? So at the bottom of your screen, you can share. You have to click on that and then you can share your screen. Right at the bottom of your screen. So, uh, where you have the mute and the camera option, beside that you will have a share option as well. If you click on that, you will get an option to share your share your screen or your tab or your window. I need to click uh, accordingly. Just give me the second place. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. So you can uh, mute yours. Okay. All right. So till he's figuring that out, so I'll ask my next question to Professor Peter Stewart. Sculptures belonging to different faiths have specific features for identification. Could you tell us about some of these features that aid in the identification of the faiths? Well, in the context of ancient Greek and Roman art, it's, uh, it, it's often not about distinguishing different faiths for the, reason, for the reasons I explained before that, you know, in, in a complex polytheistic religious system, uh, the uh, uh, people have a whole range of different beliefs that intersect with each other. Um, uh, gradually, we do start to have a distinctive iconography, a distinctive uh, body of imagery that adopted by Christians and Mithraists and other particular religious groups in the, in the Roman Empire. But before that, what's really characteristic of religious art in the Greco-Roman world is the sorts of iconography, the sorts of attributes that distinguish gods from each other. So not different faiths, but different characters, different personalities of the various gods, just as we see sometimes in modern religion as well. Um, and well, the attributes could be to do with the dress or physical appearance or deportment of the individual gods, or the lack of dress in the case of Venus or Aphrodite, the love goddess. Um, but often it's about specific objects or animals that appear with them. Uh, the king of the gods, Zeus or Jupiter, might appear with a scepter or a thunderbolt or with an eagle. Uh, uh, the messenger god, Hermes or Mercury, uh, would appear with his wand called a caduceus or with wings coming out of his head or his shoes uh, and so on and so forth. Anyone in the ancient world would have been familiar with this repertoire of attributes and they would have been able to read very quickly who these uh, who these deities were for the most part and indeed we can too if we're familiar with the with the mythology and the, the 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 repertoire of imagery of the of the classical world, um, it, 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 when it comes to the Gandharan art, uh, the, the Buddhist art of Gandhara, we have sometimes more subtle challenges in working out, uh, for example, which which Buddha is represented. Is it the historical Buddha? Or is it a Buddha of another era, past or future? Or the Bodhisattvas, the saint-like Bodhisattvas, you know, which Bodhisattvas represented? Because they appear with very similar uh, imagery, representing them like uh, richly adorned princes. 
uh, with turbans and jewelry and so on. How much somebody at the time these images were made would have been able to distinguish between these subtleties? That's something we don't really know, but it's certainly a challenge for the modern archaeologist or, or, or art historian, given the, the fragmentary evidence that we have. And in all cases, you know, we, we, we sometimes struggle to, to make connections between what we see in ancient art and what is described in ancient texts, including even the ancient religious, the ancient sacred texts of Buddhism. There's sometimes a mismatch uh, between the texts and the images. So the images, the imagery has a kind of life of its own. Yeah, and there's a mismatch in movies also sometimes, like stories or uh, uh, characteristics that are defined in books are quite different than the ones that they're shown in movies. So yeah. there's a kind of a mismatch there too. Yeah, absolutely. Artists, uh, artists are, are under no obligation simply to copy what they read or what is read to them. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is to Professor Jackson and Ryan. Could you tell us about the features of minimalist sculptures and its role in depicting religious stories or deities? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that this, um, you know, the, the connections are not um, explicit. Uh, sculpture is really contemporary sculpture, you know, I think of as a thinking process. It is formed with materials. We have relationships with these materials. So you might have a contemporary sculpture. Uh, for instance, I showed a, you know, a piece that is, has a, a conch or a, a seashell in it. Um, and I use driftwood. And so it's a very kind of regional, for, for me, I'm on the West Coast of the United States. I'm using materials that are around me. Uh, it's a thinking process, but we have relationships with materials. And so with these materials, there comes a lot of content. If you look at artists, uh, sculptors from elsewhere in the, in, the, in the United States, artists like uh, Kevin Beasley or Dario Robletto, they use materials like cotton or a fragment of a Billy, Billy Holiday album. Uh, she's a, a great American blues sort of singer, uh, quite beautiful and, and highly regarded. Or they might use like trionite from, uh, you know, it's a fused sand from the first atomic bomb test site uh, in New Mexico. So with that, with the material, you bring relationships and you bring content and you bring stories and they really elicit in a way their own deific uh, magic. I think actually Professor Mystery uh, said uh, that's where the magic lies, you know, in contemporary sculpture. For me, that's a lot of times where it, where it sits. So these artists, Dara Robledo, Kevin Beasley are very contemporary, but we could also look at some minimalist artists um, who uh, try to elevate their ideas by making sort of the divine or divine godlike uh, um, illusions. If you think about artists like earthwork artists for the United States, like Donald Judd, um, Robert Smith, Walter DeMaria, who did the lightning fields, or uh, Nancy Holt, uh, who did the piece called Sun Tunnels, these are earthwork artists in the United States. Their works are located at very specific locations, often mostly out in the West, Western part of the United States, which is much more vast and open spaces. Um, you know, visits to these works are for um, American audiences, almost like a religious pilgrimage. Uh, you go to this site, in the middle of nowhere, you know, probably after driving 12 or 13 hours to experience and to be exalted by uh, the spiral jetty, the um, lightning fields, the sun tunnels, uh, double negative uh, piece by Heitzer, 
So um, there are uh, connections and overlaps between um, minimalist sculpture and approaches to contemporary sculpture and um, the roles of um, quote unquote deities or religious experiences embedded within uh, new approaches to create the creation of, of sculptural space. And I think that in the contemporary times, artists use very less amount of objects or colors and lights to express a good amount of stories, like huge stories or perceptions portrayed in a very small or very minimalist way, like minimalist objects. Yeah, those some of those minimalist objects are just so re reduced down to almost nothing, but in through repetition, which yes. is in uh, like Donald Judd through repeating a form over and over again in a very perfect way, which is something that Donald Judd is guilty of. You know, I make connections to this kind of approach and also drone music and um, trance and the repetition of the same with minor variations to, to sort of train uh, human experiences into uh, a repetitious state, almost like a prayer or uh, a, um, um, uh, a trance state. And so to me, these things kind of overlap. I mean, I call myself a sculptor, for instance, but as I said, sculpting is a uh, it's a it's a thinking process, and sculpture also encompasses, to me, um, sound works, uh, performance works. It alludes to the real, it, and it and at the same time, it is real. Uh, it occupies real space, and changes the space around it. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I guess Professor Jua's PPTs are ready. So, sir, please carry on. Over to you, sir. <laughs> You may begin. The slides are already up. You can see. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, so I'm showing some slides from the side of all materials, you know, and the public thing of creating profiles, you know. And, uh, 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 how, the, how it dictates forms as well. Uh, 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 I try to put some of my work alone uh, in this thing as the working artist. Uh, uh, this is a, a small uh, dark stone around uh, here. It was fired. It looks like a bone now. Uh, then something made up of all this um, in 1977. Then a few lines and glass. Then the body made the kind made the very beginning study of the whole kind of art in 1991. And best made of plaster, inspired by Indian sculpture. And then uh, uh, Sleeping Man, it's made of all of us, from a long life size here, which is very like Linda Wells, Christ, um, and also a kind of uh, different color figure, it's like on the ground, uh, and a sign view. 
something made of chalk and gold leaf and silver leaf. Is that called the bubble? And then maybe you want to get some pieces like that. Then this is also chalk piece. This is made of chalk. So this is a direct carving. Then the one of one with clay and cards in front of us. It's life size. Then something going up sand and cement. The radio. And with people and children over it. And then we made it. This is made of stainless steel. Uh, last year, it's painted with a green paint. Uh, then there are some pieces made out from the area of the river. As a kind of the kind of idea of goddesses that we have in uh, Indian weather cultures. Uh, and diamonds. That's it, I think. Uh, Thank you, sir. This was a wonderful presentation. So my last question to you is, to what extent do animal sculptures portray the stories of Indian mythologies? Could you cite some examples as well? Okay. Uh, Slides. Uh, I'll show you some uh, slides of uh, uh, animal bombs. The uh, the image of the idea of the uh, made for, for the city council of Birmingham, and you can see the uh, large strong guardians on the left and right side of the uh, square. And the image is picked up from. Uh, the internet and people all the time taking photos of the work. Anyway, so the uh, figure, um, figure here uh, is actually seen as a modular being. Uh, and uh, this one also made the being as a goddess kind of goddess of the altar made in the uh, uh, and then with uh, the Chinese granite in the one and began. So yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, but anyone who gets inside, but uh, here, here, here is an image of a child of the moon, uh, in the image of men. Uh, uh, this is also in the image of a man, a woman, as a diagrammatical uh, um, thing made of stainless steel, which has hung on the wall, then uh, uh, all the uh, uh, lockdown years I worked to create from a being a kind of relief uh, using stainless steel. Uh, uh, this is the food, inspired from uh, the different tiger. 
Dann gibt es die Flugzeuge, die eine Plastikschale mobilisieren. Und das ist mehr der Platz, ein Euroglas. Das ist die Gelbe auf dem Flug. Das ist Griecher. Ein mehr der Platz. Und dann nahm ich das hier dann von der Partie meines Kreises. It's getting stuck. Das ist sie den Grund, wenn er vor Zwang dann haben wir dann ja jetzt mit dem Mail und Sendung zusammen für den GC dann die Backview auf sie den Grund mit dem Mail Laser in der Woche und dann die Mail und dann die Mail und dann die I made a little more, so this is made of plaster. Uh, and if you try to go from the other way, you are going to be thinking of how could it be made by using steel. So in 2018, uh, I made, a, I, I succeeded in making the piece uh, and the kind of composite, uh, uh, made of composite combo. Oh, this is which I an idea of a board. So this is uh, a nearly perfect. Then this is called white elephant. Obviously, uh, it comes from inspired by the uh, 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 and uh, elephant scene and the Highlander of the great Buddha. I am in dream of my adoring. Then this is uh, an elephant made of silver, uh, cast silver, which is an inch, uh, which is just an inch or so. made after some years of oh, maybe three or more months. Uh, it was made yeah, in 2015 16. And this is the so called so called she was not named after uh, this is a scene in terms of uh, the form is seen in terms of its uh, volumes together 
Thank you so much, sir. The images were wonderful. Yes, sir. So with this, we now come to the end of today's session. I would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, poems, and essays, and for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeastory.biz. I extend a heartfelt thank you to Professor Peter Stewart, Professor Jack Tuttlesnell Ryan, and Professor Dhruva Mistry for this wonderful and remarkable session today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you.